I think we can probably go ahead and, uh, and get started since it's a couple minutes after the hour. Um, so it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Jack Harris. Um, so I suspect Jack need, needs little to no introduction for most of you, but um, for those of you who are unfamiliar and need a refresher, Jack did his PhD at UC Santa Barbara with uh, David Auschalam, and then went on to do a postdoc uh, at the, the CUA with Wolfgang Ketterly and John Doyle. So, uh, you know, Jack, if you didn't know what AMO stood for, <laughs> At UCSB, I guess by the time you got to the CUA, you probably had a pretty good idea. Um, but before becoming a professor at Yale, uh, he has received many awards, including he's an APS fellow, uh, recently became a Vannevar Bush faculty fellow, uh, and also received the Arthur Greer Memorial Prize. Uh, I had the pleasure of collaborating with Jack during my PhD, and he's an um, exceptionally careful and insightful experimentalist. Um, but what I admire most about Jack is how, just how creative his experiments are. He's done a number of really cool and kind of more exotic type of experiments. He did, he did beautiful experiments measuring persistent currents in normal metals using cantilevers to actually detect the persistent currents. Um, he pioneered the field of dispersive uh, optomechanics with silicon nitride membranes, which at least as I understand it, were intended for something totally different, but Jack decided to put them in a cavity anyway. Um, and um, he was doing uh, exceptional points in non-Hermitian quantum systems well before that was a cool hot topic that it, as it's become more recently. Uh, and today we're gonna hear about work he's done uh, on optomechanics with levitated superfluid helium, which is just really awesome. Um, so the one last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Jack is that if you're like me and you sometimes feel like you kind of run out of internet, like you sort of uh, ha can't find anything interesting on the internet. You've read all the sites that you normally read. I highly recommend going to Jack's group's website and finding the archive of his whimsical sites of the Fortnite, um, which has sent me down many, numerous rabbit holes. Um, every once in a while I rediscover it and it's always a pleasure. So with that, I'll hand it over to Jack. Uh, so thank you, Shimon. First of all, uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, great. Uh, that's a very kind introduction, overly kind uh, in some places. But I definitely want to say that is the first public mention of my group's whimsical side of the fortnight, which has been a you know, 15 year effort on my part. So I'm, I'm just, you're literally the first person I've ever known who I've known to actually read it. Like this is fantastic news. My readership base just increased by a factor of infinity from zero to one. So boy, that is, that is very satisfying. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm grateful for the opportunity to chat. Uh, so thank you, Shimon, for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be a part of VAMUS. Um, how nice to have like a broad-based national, international AMO talk that people can check in on a given week or not, or listen to asynchronously. Uh, for those of you who are watching asynchronously in the distant or near future, greetings from the past. Um, I hope it's been okay. Um, I too watch talks asynchronously sometimes uh, when I'm doing exercise or traveling or something like that. And I really find watching them at 1.75 is just like, that is the right speed. I can just tell what they're saying and if something important comes up, I slow down. So it'll be interesting to know whether my practice of listening to asynchronous talks at 75% above normal speed has changed my speaking rate. So just bear that in mind if you have to slow me down or speed me up, it's okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about optomechanics experiments, and I'm mostly not going to be talking about the levitated superfluid helium. I'll say a little bit about that at the end, uh, but I'll be talking about experiments on cavities uh, that are filled with superfluid helium. And this is just a project that we've made a little bit more progress on. Um, so I'll begin by giving an introduction uh, to the field of optomechanics a little bit, just sort of explain what I think some of its appeal is. And in specific, I will try to motivate it as providing a route to studying quantum phenomena and surprisingly large objects. Then I'll say a little bit about why superfluid helium is such an exciting material for doing this. I mean, I think both for quantum optics and quantum acoustics, it really has some serious untapped potential. I'll describe how we use single photon detectors as single phonon detectors and how they represent a useful source of nonlinearity for us. I'll talk about our sort of preliminary measurements on 
uh, measuring higher order phonon correlations in a body of superfluid helium. And at the end, I'll talk about where we're headed. I wanna mention that this work is done uh, in large part through the helpful collaboration with Jacob Reichel's group in Paris. And I wanna thank the graduate students, Yichi, Lucy, and Sean, who've worked on this project. And in particular, I wanna single out the contribution of Yogesh Patil, the postdoc who's led this effort, and of course our theory colleagues. Uh, okay, so um, as I mentioned, I think one of the reasons for that drives the field of optomechanics is that it provides a way of studying quantum mechanics on the large scale. And for some people, they hear those words and they just say, yeah, that's great. That would be super exciting. We should do that. Some people hear it and they say, why bother? We know quantum mechanics is a great theory. You know, what does it matter whether the object is big or small? Um, so I would say that the motivations for doing this um, fall into roughly three categories. One is very much in the first one that I mentioned, which is just pure intellectual curiosity. Um, in my opinion, the fact that Marcus Arndt's group in Vienna can take molecules that look like this and send them flying through a meters long vacuum chamber, have them pass through real physical slits, just like Einstein and Bohr drew in, the, in their debates uh, in the 1920s about quantum mechanics and collect those molecules on a phosphorescent screen where each one of these flashes is the arrival of one of these molecules and see the interference pattern associated with the wave function uh, that describes the center of mass position of this big, complicated, messy molecule. That's just amazing and inspiring that like quantum mechanics really works. This formalism holds up to such a surprising uh, size and complexity scale. And if all that this field ever accomplished was to learn how to do this kind of thing with bigger and bigger objects, I would regard that as a noble pursuit, definitely worth worth working in. At the same time, mechanical devices of various kinds are a really sophisticated and powerful technology in scientific applications and cell phones, modern telecommunications and the like. And in general, if you can take a technology that's robust and really mature and add to it quantum functionality, usually there's a benefit to read there of one kind or another. This benefit's already being reaped in uh, contemporary gravitational wave detectors. Lastly, there's a possibility that the quantum mechanics of sufficiently massive, large, complicated objects is just somehow different. I mean, there's never been a, a theory of the physical universe that has proved to be valid over an unbounded domain, right? At some point, we're going to find a surprise. And it's possible that whatever corrections to the linear evolution of quantum mechanics that exist might uh, be manifest in large objects. And there's you know, specific ideas about that uh, in theories that describe an objective wave function collapse uh, and the like. It's also uh, evident uh, that we, since we don't have a quantum theory of space-time geometry, it's a little bit of an open question how to describe a situation in which a massive object is in a superposition of two places at once. And really, I mean, a map, an object that's sufficiently massive that it deforms the geometry of space-time in its vicinity. Simply don't know how to describe this. And people have proposed that maybe experiments at the tabletop scale might provide us with some inputs, uh, some clues about what such a theory would have to contain. Uh, so anyway, these are three very different reasons for thinking about uh, experimental tests of quantum mechanics on a macroscopic scale. Optomechanical devices are a specific way of doing that. There are other ways, but this is kind of one way. And I would say the basic approach, uh, the basic paradigm consists of here's the massive object uh, in whose quantum uh, phenomena we are interested. And let's assume it's a harmonic oscillator. Most massive objects have their low energy degrees of freedom as indeed harmonic oscillations. That's indicated by this spring here. Um, and a, a very you know, successful route to trying to look for quantum effects in this big, heavy, slow, hot, uh, frustratingly classical object is to start with a microscopic degree of freedom whose quantum mechanics we understand pretty well, both from a fundamental point of view and a technical point of view. And in this case, let's take that to be one mode of the electromagnetic field. So you take one mode of the electromagnetic field, you prepare it in some kind of quantum state, um, then you arrange a situation in which it has a unitary interaction 
with this macroscopic degree of freedom. Just textbook quantum mechanics would say that generically, the joint system will then evolve into an entangled state where whatever kind of superposition you've prepared over here, the system evolves conditionally depending on what the state is over here. And so you end up with a entanglement between the two of them. Um, then assuming that the only kind of really robust quantum measurement technology that we have uh, is what we can apply to measurements of the state of light, we let the light eventually leak out of the cavity and apply those measurements to this subsystem, just the subsystem consisting of the electromagnetic field. And from those measurements, try to infer what kind of interesting quantum mechanical behavior might have taken place with this macroscopic object. This is the basic approach of quantum optomechanics, uh, as I would as I would see it. And uh, the Hamilton, if you want to describe this as a Hamiltonian, it's just two harmonic oscillators, the optical one, the mechanical one, usually coupled just by this three wave uh, mixing term. And the size of the only non trivial term in this Hamiltonian is G naught, which you can think of as the rate at which a phonon in this cavity gets converted to a sideband photon by absorbing or emitting a phonon into this oscillator um, sets the you know kind of technological size scale for the the physics that we're interested in and this is just small and it's small because really in practice the only unitary interaction between light and the center of mass degree of freedom of a macroscopic object that we have is radiation pressure if the photon gets absorbed and turned into heat in this object, that's not unitary evolution. It's not useful for this kind of approach. It has to exchange information with this macroscopic object center of mass degree of freedom um, without, uh, but keeping that information within the joint system, not being lost in the environment. And really what we have to work with there is radiation pressure or its cousins, electrostriction, dipole forces and the like. And that's just weak. You can go outside on a bright sunny day and get a, a bad sunburn Right, you will have absorbed a lot of photons, but you will hardly have been aware of the fact that there's any pressure associated with those photons. It's just weak. Um, and that sets a technical challenge in this field. So to try to overcome that, we do a bunch of things. We try to make high finesse cavities so that any given photon bounces around in here an awful lot. We try to make this object, you know, as low mass as possible so that it recoils substantially, but not so low mass that it stops being macroscopic, whatever that means. Um, we want this mechanical oscillator not to be constantly decohered by its environment, because there's always an environment for mechanical oscillators. Uh, so we'd like it to have high quality factors. We'd like whatever bath is out here uh, to be as cold as possible. Uh, and I'll say more about this, but at some point, in order to get at the most interesting structure of quantum mechanics, we need some nonlinearity in this system. And the system starts out as just harmonic oscillators with a weak nonlinearity. Um, so I'll say more about that in a minute, but just taking some steps toward there. In such a device, we care about uh, how these parameters come together in various dimensionless ways. We care about the cavity finesse. We care about whether mechanical motion is a resolved sideband or an unresolved sideband with respect to the cavity. We care about the temperature of the bath in terms of how many phonon numbers it wants to equilibrate this mode to. We care about the cooperativities and the like. But in order to get at the most interesting quantum mechanical effects, we want uh, the nonlinearities. And within this Hamiltonian, the only nonlinearity is this one. And to make it appreciable on the scale of single quanta, where like you would really have the full you know, the uh, harmonic oscillator equivalence of the James Cummings ladder and the like, you would need to be a situation in which this optomechanical single photon coupling rate is the biggest frequency scale in the problem, bigger than the mechanical frequencies, bigger than the cavity line width. Um, and there's nothing fundamental preventing this from happening, but as far as I know, to date, this has just not been possible in optomechanical systems. Okay. So if what we're after is nonlinearities, the bare Hamiltonian doesn't quite provide us with what we want. Now, let me say a little bit about why it is we want those nonlinearities. And the reason has to do with um, kind of, if you are interested in whether this big heavy object is obeying the laws of quantum mechanics, 
um, it's helpful to think about which aspects, which of the characters of quantum mechanics you are testing in any given measurement. And just to pedagogically motivate the idea that there's kind of a hierarchy of which quantum effects or how quantum various effects are, um, let me just tell the following story. Suppose that I have a physical system like a harmonic oscillator and I can prepare it in a perfectly pure quantum state like the ground state. This is a quantum mechanical state. And let's, propose, let's imagine that I have a perfectly strong projective position measurement. So I prepare the state and I measure its position. I get a result. I prepare the state again. I measure the position again. Do this over and over again. And I list all of my measurement, position measurement results into a histogram and it'll look like this. If I prepare that state and measure momentum in a similar way over and over again, those momentum results will look like this. And if I measure any linear combination of X and P, I'll get the same Gaussian. And you can say, well, quantum mechanics is clearly manifest here. It's the width of this Gaussian. You put the system in its lowest energy state, quantum mechanics would say that should be widthless, uh, but you find that it has a certain width here. But you can always say, well, look, these uh, measurement outcomes, these distributions are the marginals of a perfectly reasonable probability function that's defined over classical phase space, which is to say a probability function that assigns an a priori joint simultaneous probability to both position and momentum and just says, that's what the probability was for this X and this P. And you just happen to come in and measure it and you got such and such a result. This is precisely the story that we would tell about a classical harmonic oscillator coupled to a classical thermal bath whose temperature just happens to be numerically right to give me the width uh, dictated by H bar, but otherwise no exotica, no weird phenomena. Even though I prepared this perfectly pure quantum state, there's no operationally, there's no evidence of any of the rich and interesting structure of quantum mechanics in such a measurement. Now to show you kind of what the uh, counterpart to that is, suppose I prepare this state, which in your introductory quantum mechanics textbook does not, you know, obviously more exotic than this one, but just the first excited state. And I do exactly the same thing. I prepare the state, I measure position, prepare the state, measure position. I get a histogram that looks like this, the square modulus of the wave function. Do the same thing with momentum, looks like this. Do the same thing with any linear combination of X and P, get the same thing. And now if I ask, well, what uh, function in phase space are these the marginals of? It's a perfectly well-defined function. It looks like this. The only problem is that that function has negative values. And so whatever it is, it is not a probability. So what this says is that there is no probability function defined over X and P whose marginals would reproduce your measurements. So if you like, this is immediately putting you in connection with something richer uh, than just extra fluctuations. This is putting you in contact with something like uh, the non-commutative nature of position and momentum, the absence of a well-defined value for each of these uh, quantities. Um, as there's this, there are a lot of ways of thinking about this hierarchy. There are a lot of different steps and stuff, but it is worth mentioning that qualitatively, there's still another higher level in which the same story about the non-existence of a joint probability distribution um, extends to physical quantities that are associated with well-separated distinct physical objects, possibly space-like separated objects. Um, this is the essential point of Bell's original paper. Uh, so anyway, this is just a, meant to be a very cursory introduction to the idea that we need uh, states like this to get out of uh, boring phenomenology like this. And uh, you can't take a harmonic oscillator in any state like this and get to a state like this without nonlinearity. You need something nonlinear to do that. Um, correspondingly, it's just as important to be careful about what kind of uh, readout one is employing in trying to access physics like this. So I told you a story where an oscillator is coupled to some, I don't know, infinitely strong projective measurement of position, which in reality, we just don't have. Um, in uh, one generation of optomechanical devices, it was much more common to take the harmonic oscillator, couple it to a bright coherent state of an electromagnetic mode, and then measure that electromagnetic mode on a photodiode. So measure something like the mean photon number via the photon current. And in such a measurement, it turns out that even if you're able to prepare a state like this, um, the character of this readout will tend to obscure most of the interesting physics associated with the state. Going up a bit further, and this is really will be the 
focus of my talk, if you have a harmonic oscillator, and again, you couple it to a coherent state of the electromagnetic field, but your readout detector is a photon capture, something that goes click with the arrival of each individual photon, that's really qualitatively different in terms of how much of this interesting quantum physics you can extract out of the data coming from this photo detector. So the main point of my talk really is to kind of try and get here and here, given that we started out here and here. Um, so that's kind of the introduction. Uh, maybe this is a natural place to just ask if there are questions on this. Sure, uh, I think we have a couple questions. So um, maybe I'll start off with one. Could you maybe give some intuition for what the difference is between those two diagrams that you just showed? I mean, doesn't a photodiode on some level still count photons? Um, so maybe I maybe I have extra noise that, that obscures it, but, but what, what's the, you know, what's the difference? Um, so there are ways uh, to, you know, reconstruct uh, a measurement like this using photo uh, using photodiodes. This would be uh, standard Wigner function tomographic reconstruction. Um, on the other hand, um, I, I'm going to give you an answer really in about two slides. It's the back action of the click here. Um, we can arrange things such that a single click here really tells me that I have prepared this state. So really what we're gonna do is uh, less about this measurement, so to speak, but rather about how the back action of this measurement drives an oscillator from a state like this to a state like that. That's okay. the main utility of the click-based detector that we're gonna use. Great, so then we have a question from Andrew McRae in the audience. Uh, following up, what about optical homodyne tomography? Yeah, so again, like the tomography, uh, could allow you to reconstruct a Wigner function completely legitimately. My question though would be, how would you prepare this state? Okay, you can't use the homodyne tomography to prepare this state if you start here. And then um, Aruku Senu was wondering, uh, do you have a common parameter to measure to quantify how non-Gaussian a state is? I don't, but people do. So, um, if these words are maybe a little bit ill-defined or fuzzily defined, that's a fair point. Um, when people want to sort of dive down into the details and be quantitative, there are ways of quantifying this. So for example, how much negativity is there in your Wigner function? How much is your function different than the incoherent superposition of coherent states? Um, uh, what kind of quantum information information processing advantage could you extract from such a state or how much metrological advantage could you extract? When people want to be quantitative, those are the kinds of questions they pose. This is meant to be more qualitative. Um, and and then, thought, um, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, so uh, maybe last question for now and then I'll let you move on. So John uh, Simon was wondering, uh, could you think about increasing the nonlinearity by embedding a strongly interacting two level system in the mechanical oscillator? Yeah, that's right here in the lower right hand part of my slide, which just in the interest of time I haven't talked about. But yeah, if you uh, put a two level system in your harmonic oscillator and use that as an intermediary, for example, boy, that's a, a really good route to take and people are doing that. Uh, oh, and sorry, I misattributed the question. It was from John Kunjiman, not, not, not John Simon. There's too many Johns on the panel, so my mistake. Okay. Uh, all right, we'll let, you, we'll let you move on though. Okay. Last thing I'll just say is likewise, there's this word macroscopic that I've been using without a proper definition. Again, there are kind of similar stories you could tell where given a certain context, a certain question that you have in mind, there are ways of quantifying what one might mean by macroscopic in certain settings. For the purposes of this talk though, where we still have a ways to go, I'm just gonna appeal to your qualitative intuition that if it looks big, it's big. <laughs> Um, okay, so now to say a little bit more about this uh, single photon detection and why it's useful for us. Suppose you have a cavity and you are sending in light and you're collecting the light that comes out. If it goes in green, it's going to come out green. On the other hand, if your end mirror is free to oscillate, light that comes in green can just classically acquire phase modulation sidebands from this oscillating mirror. Here they are. And there's no reason to invoke quantum mechanics. But if I have a detector here that really goes click with each photon, when it goes click, it either went click because it got hit by a blue photon 
or green one or a red photon. And if it got hit by a blue photon, you're entitled to ask, how did a photon that came in green come out blue? And the answer is it extracted probably one phonon's worth of energy from this mechanical oscillator and got promoted to the sideband, likewise with red. And that's you know interesting, uh, but it's mostly interesting because what it tells you is that if you know that a given click, let's say came from a red sideband photon, that tells you that whatever the unknown state of this mechanical oscillator was beforehand, after that click, you have added exactly one phonon to it. And that's potentially useful if what you're trying to do is go from this state, ground state, to a first excited state. Okay, so that's really kind of where we're headed. Um, and likewise, if you know that the click came from a blue photon, you can say whatever state I started with, I just extracted exactly one phonon from it. Now, the technical challenge here, again, comes from the smallness of this optomechanical interaction, which ensures that uh, only about out of every billion photons that comes in, uh, all but 10 of them will come back out as unshifted green photons that have no particular information in them. Only about 10 in a billion come out in these sidebands. And these detectors that we have don't themselves tell you, hey, it was a little bit blue shifted, it was a little bit red shifted. They mostly just go click. Um, so the clicks that we actually extract are not useful in telling us anything about the state of the mechanical oscillator. So the idea is just put a very good filter here, which is good enough that it blocks all but the photons of interest. So that when you get a click here, if you like, you've structured these electromagnetic modes such that when you get a click here, you know that it was a red sideband photon. And that click really tells you that you just added exactly one phonon to this mechanical oscillator. And this kind of idea has been you know, successfully employed in traditional quantum optics fields. It's been applied to uh, optomechanics for some time, especially successfully in uh, Simon Groblocker and Marcus Aspelmeyer's groups. And this is the idea that we are just borrowing. Um, so the actual optomechanical system that we build consists of, in some levels, just a conventional Fabry Perot cavity. But Jacob Reichel's group in Paris uh, has this amazing technology for taking single mode optical fibers, laser machining a concavity onto their surface. Turns out that this concavity is super polished. You can send it to a coating company, they will deposit high finesse mirrors on it. You can take, then take two of these fibers and point them at each other, as shown here, and these concavities ensure you that you have a stable optical resonator between them. And the beauty is that this cavity mode is actually pretty well coupled to the traveling wave inside the fiber. So as soon as you take these two fibers, we have some nice kinematic arrangements for plopping them down, epoxying them in place. You have a completely rigid, uh, very robust, high finesse optical cavity, 100,000 finesse, um, where there's no input optics. There's no mode matching. You just have two fibers that you can run out of a cryostat, plug into uh, your favorite fiber optic network somewhere, and it's done. There's no, again, just like no free space optics, nothing to adjust, nothing to align once the initial alignment is done. And that works, that's really nice for working inside of cryostats. At the same time, it's just an empty optical cavity. So for a mechanical degree of freedom, we fill the cavity with liquid helium. And uh, superfluid helium for all of its exotic properties also possesses sound. And its sound is completely garden variety. It's just linear acoustics. So once you fill this uh, region with superfluid helium, there is another field, in this case, it's the density of the liquid helium that obeys a wave equation and which sees as a boundary condition these same mirrors. So what that means is that the sound waves in this liquid helium um, have a set of cavity modes that are just the exact same kind of standing wave cavity modes as the optical cavity, and they're perfectly overlapped. They're defined by the same surfaces with the same curvatures. Um, and that's a big deal. That's uh, the efficient overlap of your optical cavity with your acoustic cavity makes for efficient optomechanical coupling. Um, none of that has anything to do with the miraculous materials properties of superfluid helium though. What superfluid helium does have, um, first of all, is this enormous band gap, but much more importantly, a total absence of any kind of impurity. Zero chemical impurity atoms, zero structural defects, zero free charges, everything just falls through the superfluid, hits a wall and freezes solid. And it's a superfluid, so it can't have a crack, it can't have a vacancy. 
Um, as a result, uh, power handling capabilities, extremely good, uh, optical absorption, extremely low. Same thing goes for mechanical uh, excitations, very uh, low loss mechanically. Turns out to have very good thermal conductivity at low temperatures. This story of the construction that I just told you means you build this thing and you have perfectly aligned optical and acoustic modes. So there's unlike really kind of almost every other optical, optomechanical system, there's no in-situ translation stages. And I always have to say, we love AttoCube, we love JPE, they make amazing products. But if we can do an experiment without using that extra complications, it's nice, it's nice. Um, the superfluid helium can host interesting hybrid quantum systems. This is supposed to say electron bubbles here, and it can be used for a lot of other things too. So it's a fun system to think about. Just from the point of view of Optomechanics, though, we have an optical mode, which I've shown here as blue, as red, sorry, the optical intensity. And we have an acoustic mode, which is the oscillating sound wave, organ pipe mode of the liquid helium density. And to do optomechanics, these have to couple to each other. It's not just enough to have two modes. The way that they couple is just that liquid helium has an index of refraction. And the denser it gets, the more you smush it together, that index of refraction goes up. And so as the sound wave is oscillating, you can see like right now, there are too many helium atoms piled up where the optical intensity is also piled up. And so as far as this optical mode is concerned, the cavity doesn't physically get longer, but its index of refraction is oscillating. And that's the same thing. The cavity detuning is doing this because of the motion or something. So that's the coupling. And if, uh, mathematically, it is exactly the same thing as having a moving end mirror. Um, but this is kind of the physics of how it's realized. And physically, the analog of radiation pressure on the end of the mirror is the electrostriction force in which this optical intensity is trying to suck helium atoms into where the laser is bright, but it's, it's completely identical. Now, one thing that's really nice about this device is that uh, in all of optomechanics, whenever we build a cavity and put some sort of vibrating thing inside of it, there's usually one mode of that vibrating thing that we're really interested in, that we took great care to make sure it's a really high Q oscillator of the cantilever or whatever. But any physical object has an extremely large number of vibrational modes, and probably all of them detune the cavity in some way or the other. And this is just a giant headache in the field of optomechanics that we learn how to deal with, we learn how to frequency segregate the acoustic modes, you know, do this and that but it is, it's always a pain in the neck and it is completely removed in this device. The reason being that we have a situation in which the optical cavity and the acoustic cavity have the exact same geometry, the exact same boundary conditions, the exact same wave equation. And so what that means is that when I calculate mode overlaps, so like here I've drawn the same optical mode over and over again, but I've drawn every different acoustic wave. And you can see that for most of them, just kind of by symmetry, uh, the overlap integral between optical intensity and liquid helium density, which is what I care about for the coupling, is just zero, 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 not zero, 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 zero again. So the way this device is, is designed, there's just intrinsically truly single mode optomechanical coupling. Any optical mode couples to exactly one acoustic mode. Uh, and that just sort of simplifies things from a practical point of view. Um, so these devices, because they require no in-situ alignment, uh, they're very robust, we build a whole bunch of them. Here's a photograph of one, but we typically cool down three at a time. They go in a little cell like this. That cell requires only one fill line for liquid helium to come in, one optical fiber for each cavity, and that's it. There's no electrodes, there's no coaxes, there's no piezos, there's no atto cubes, there's no translation stages, that's it. So um, it would be straightforward to put 100 or even 1,000 of these inside of a conventional dilution refrigerator. And at that point, you just have a bunch of random devices. But as I'll talk about at the very end of my talk, I think there's a nice way uh, to tune all of those devices into real indistinguishability and to use them as indistinguishable quantum emitters and nodes in a nice uh, quantum communications arrangement. Okay, but for now, uh, let me start to tell you about the measurements. So the way that this setup works is there's a dilution refrigerator with the device shown here with this optical mode and this acoustic mode that's living there. Um, we have uh, two lasers, one which can be detuned to the blue sideband 
one which can be detuned to the red sideband. In this case, we've shown the red detuned laser. This is just a filter to gobble up some of the laser noise. Then it's sent to the cryogenic apparatus. Light comes back, possibly with some of those interesting sideband photons on them. Then they pass through two filter cavities, which are intended only to pass the interesting sideband photons. Those then go to superconducting nanowire single photon detectors, the things that really go click. And in a setup where we have, let's say, the laser tuned to the red side, uh, to the blue side of the cavity, uh, phonon um, creation events will produce one photon right here, which passes through the filter cavity and gets detected at the detector. And this is actual data um, showing our timing sequence. We spend about 100 milliseconds locking up all these cavities, then 100 milliseconds where the cavities are all free to drift. They don't drift too much. And during that time, we count the photons that arrive at these SPDs. And each of these is a real click. If you zoom way into these clicks and just look at the analog voltage coming out, um, it's very high signal to noise ratio, very unambiguous, with a timing resolution better than a nanosecond. So we really get individual detections that tell us exactly one photon has been added or subtracted from the acoustic mode. Yeah, this is data where I'm showing you the average photon count rate as we take this frequency here and tune it uh, left and right. And basically, as we tune it a little bit, there's always sideband photons being produced. But if it's not at exactly the right frequency, those sideband photons aren't exactly on resonance with the filter cavity. So what you're seeing here is the uh, line shape of this filter cavity, which is indeed about one megahertz wide. And I forgot to mention this. The, the one mode that uh, you do couple to um, always has the acoustic mode has exactly half the wavelength of the optical mode which when you go through the speed of light and the speed of sound and liquid helium, means we're always looking at an acoustic mode whose frequency is about 315 megahertz. So basically we see a lot of photons come through when this laser tone is exactly 315 megahertz detuned from the filter cavity, really. We also see a background. These are stray photons uh, and the like. We also see this bump here, which is just present in all of our data and we can uh, we've tracked it back to just the thermal fluctuations of the room temperature optical fibers. This is a well-known sort of phase modulation artifact in optical fibers. But this peak here is the interesting photon creation or annihilation data. Likewise, if we take the laser and put it over here on the other side band, then every uh, side band photon that actually gets shifted and makes it through the filter cavity uh, represents the annihilation of a single phonon. And that corresponding data looks very similar, very similar backgrounds, uh, but the phonon creation slash annihilation peak is distinctly different in height. And this different height is what's known as the quantum sideband asymmetry and just represents well, the various ways of thinking about it, but you can think about it as the different matrix elements associated with adding or subtracting one quantum from an oscillator. Um, in everything that I talk about, we'll really be focusing on these interesting photons. We've characterized this background carefully. We sort of know how big it is. We know that it has Poisson statistics. And so where it's appropriate, I'll be subtracting off uh, this contribution of the background. Um, we can get some confidence in our assignment uh, interpretation of these peaks just by looking at their heights as we vary the temperature of the device. So that's what's shown up here at the top. Um, the blue data is the height of this blue peak. The red data is the height of this red peak. And you can see a couple of things. One is that as the fridge gets hotter, both peaks go up. There's just more phonons to annihilate or create. Um, and uh, as you get colder, they're less and less. And you can see that the acoustic mode seems to be in equilibrium with the fridge down to something like 30 millikelvin. Um, you can also see this persistent difference between the height of the red and the height of the blue sideband. And this is uh, one of the signatures of the quantum sideband asymmetry. It also gives, once we are confident in that interpretation, it gives us a very nice calibration for all of our other signals. We can also look at this device as we sit at the lowest temperature of the fridge, but start to crank up the power that we're sending in to probe the device. And at very low powers, we see red sideband and a blue sideband, this distinct heights. As we crank up the laser power, we see uh, two distinct things happening. And this solid line here is a fit to that model. The device just gets hotter. You send in more laser power, there is some heating. And so both 
that causes the signal from both the blue sideband and the red sideband to go up. Um, and this dashed line here is that contribution, which is just based on a simple model of heat flow out of the superfluid to the dill fridge. Um, but in addition, when we're taking the blue data, the laser is detuned to the blue of the cavity. And this results in an anti-damping of the acoustic mode, which tends to ring up the cavity, if you like. When the laser is on the red side, it is laser cooling the acoustic mode, and so tends to lower the apparent phonon number. So putting all these things together gives us this fit here, and again gives us another calibration for the things like the optomechanical coupling rate. Um, so this is basic characterization of our device, and this is all phenomena that you could extract from heterodyne measurements of these motional sidebands, um, because all this is is just the mean photon rate. But buried in our data is the record of the arrival time of every single photon. And it's in that record that we're going to start to look uh, for some more interesting, interesting signals. So again, coming out of the detector of peaks like this, uh, these basically serve as timestamps for the arrivals of sideband photons. And so standard ways of characterizing this would just be to take all those timestamps, take all the intervals between them, and from that calculate the two-point correlation function of these sideband photons. Um, now, uh, we have the photon data. We would like to say something about what that photon data means in terms of the phonons in the mechanical oscillator. Um, and the way that optomechanics converts photons to phonons is such that if your laser is red detuned, there's just a mapping between the photon creation operator and the phonon creation operator. So whatever G2 you see for the photons, that's the G2 of the phonons. And that's shown here, along with a fit to the expectation for uh, uh, an acoustic mode, which is doing the emitting of these sideband photons being in a thermal state. And specifically, the fact that it's such a nice single exponential is a result of the fact that we really only couple to a single acoustic mode. This is real single mode quantum optics. When the laser is detuned to the blue side, uh, it's the annihilation of a photon that gives rise to the creation of a phonon. So when you measure the uh, G2 of your photons, what you're measuring is sort of the anti-normally ordered analog of G2 for the phonons. And again, that data is shown here. And for a thermal state, there's no real difference between these things. For more exotic states, there are important differences between this anti-normally -normal ordered G, which we call H, but for a thermal state, it's all predicted to be the same. And so the apparent difference between these two data sets is just that when the laser is blue detuned, the, the mechanical mode is anti-damped, and so it has a longer ring down time. When the laser is red detuned, the acoustic mode is damped, and it has a shorter ring down time. That's the only difference here. Otherwise, they look identical. With all this data, though, we don't have to stop at just the two-point correlation function. We can also uh, look at all the triples of photon counts. Each triple has two times, and we can look at the histogram of those uh, two times. So here, for every click that we get, we say, well, what's the time to the next click after that? And then from that click, what's the time to the third click? And each point here is one of these triples. And uh, this is shown along with the fit. It's a little hard to compare in 3D, so I'm also showing you the residuals to the fit. And again, it does exactly what you would expect a thermal state to do. It goes to six at the origin decays in the way that you'd expect. You don't have to stop there. We can take quadruples of photon counts. Each one has three time events associated with it. Uh, three time events means I would have to show you a solid cube of data. We do take that data and we fit it, but it's just hard to show. So I'll just show you one slice of the cube, one face of that cube. Again, it shows the same qualitative features, uh, good residuals, and a nice fit to what you'd expect for a thermal state. Um, um, the one fit parameter that we use here is the size of this uh, multipoint correlation function at the origin. Um, theoretically, for a thermal state, it's supposed to be two for the two-point correlation, six for the six-point, 24 for the four-point correlation functions. And the fact that the theory reproduces these, um, I would say, just really tells us that this is definitely a thermal state. It's not just some fluctuations with a certain mean and a certain variance that you would reasonably expect to be thermal. But this is a verification that the statistics are Gaussian all the way up to the fourth cumulant. Uh, there's no interesting quantum mechanics really here. Uh, this is, uh, 
but I feel like it's a very thorough characterization of a fairly boring state. Um, we can do some post-selecting and look at uh, higher order uh, effects. This is, uh, for example, right here. This is what happens if we take that giant string of data and throw away all of the data except what comes within, say, uh, right after a click. So this is the G2, the two-point correlation function, only given that there has just been a click. So this is the G2 of the phonon added thermal state or the G2 of the phonon subtracted thermal state. And it, and it agrees with uh, just what you would calculate. Uh, so again, this is a thorough characterization of a fairly boring state. We'd like to move beyond that. So our first steps in doing that uh, to go a bit further is what I'll tell you about uh, in the last little bit of my talk. Um, so what we have done is to try to produce uh, not just whatever state we get from equilibrating with the fridge, but we've tried to just add a linear drive to displace that state, to take what would be a ground state and turn it into a coherent state. Or in our case, we seem to have a thermal photon number of about one or two, so it'd be a displaced thermal state. Um, that's of interest for some real reasons. Um, one is that if you can prepare a really highly displaced ground state or thermal state, this is the kind of state that you would use to achieve quantum limited parameter estimation. So for example, if you want to read out the mechanical resonant frequency of this oscillator and ask, well, what would I need to do to make a quantum limited measurement of that? You would want something like a coherent state um, of, your, of your mode in here. Um, if you like, this is what LIGO is doing when it's reading out the resonant frequency of its optical cavity. It wants to pump that thing with a very bright coherent state. So that's what we would like to do here. Turns out there are also some interesting ideas that I won't have time to say much about uh, proposing that high amplitude coherent states of massive objects might offer some interesting tests of space-time geometry at very small length scales. So that's something we keep an eye on. Anyway, in order to drive, just apply a linear drive to the acoustic mode, we just send in two extra laser beams who are chosen such that their beat note can be varied and swept across the acoustic mode's resonant frequency just to drive the acoustic mode. And the detection is carried out still by just sending in one red detuned laser beam. Uh, when the mode starts to ring, it will put sidebands on all of these laser beams, but it's only this beam whose sideband is resonant with the filter cavity and so gets detected. And this is that data here where we're sweeping the, res the drive frequency of these two lasers beat notes, and then plotting here the photon count rate, the rate at which we're counting sideband photons as we drive harder and harder and harder. And the first thing that we can take away from this is that just the height of these peaks is nice and linear in the strength of the drive that we apply. And given our earlier calibration, we know sort of this corresponds to about 20 some odd thousand phonons in this acoustic mode. And the fact that the line shape looks constant and that the size is linear in the drive suggests that there's nothing terribly weird going on at this drive level. Um, but what we would like to know is, have we really preserved the purity of the state? We know we started out with just kind of one thermal phonon. We know we've displaced it out to 20,000, 30,000 phonons, but did we add a bunch of noise in doing so? Um, the optimist would say, no, it's just a linear drive, but in all honesty, if there's phase noise on these lasers, if there's parameter noise in the mechanical oscillator, you will get some sort of wandering around coherent state, which is not nearly as useful. So in order to test that, what we do is we look at the G2 of those sideband photons when the mechanical oscillator is driven. When it's not driven, we get this pink data, which is just what you'd expect for a thermal state. It goes to two, relaxes to one. As we drive it harder and harder, it retains a little bit of its thermal character, but it gets closer and closer to just being a constant at one, what you would expect for a coherent state. We can look a little bit more closely. This is uh, similar data where what I'm plotting now is G2 minus one on a log scale. And the red is the undriven data. It goes from two, or what is one on this plot, decays exponentially. As you drive it harder and harder, uh, you can really see the qualitative evolution to a nearly flat, but on this logarithmic scale, distinctly not quite flat uh, G2. So what we do is we fit each of these curves and we extract out the G2 at the origin. And that's plotted here as a function of the mean phonon number in the oscillator. And when the mean phonon number is much smaller than the thermal phonon number, it looks thermal. You have a thermal state, you've displaced it, but by less than the thermal blob. And so it looks, you get a G2 of two. But as you start to displace it, 
more than its original thermal noise blob, it gradually transitions to looking like a coherent state. And this is that same data just plotted with one subtracted off on a log scale. And you can see that it really approaches what you'd expect if you were not adding any extra noise. So whatever the state is, we're just displacing it and preserving its purity. Um, and that's really the end of kind of the results that I have. We can make these high uh, purity coherent states and high amplitude ones. Um, the last couple minutes, that's the last one slide would be about some future directions, but maybe this is a natural place to pause and uh, ask if there have been questions. Yeah, great. There's there's quite a few questions. Um, okay. So uh, going back to where you were explaining why this only couples to a single acoustic mode, um, mm -hmm. Aziza was wondering, do you have to worry about transverse modes of the optical cavity? And is there some equivalent of transverse Hermite-Gauss or Laguerre-Gauss modes in the mechanical mode? Um, yeah. So last question first, yes, it's the exact same wave equation. It's just the scalar wave equation for the density, exact same boundary conditions, yes. You have all the Hermite-Gauss or Laguerre, whatever you think, uh, whatever you like to use. Um, the optics, you don't have to worry so much because you are sending in a laser. You pick its frequency. And chances are, because these cavities don't tend to have really degenerate modes, by sweeping that laser frequency, you're really putting the light into just one mode. I mean, not at the part per million level, but if I look at you know one cavity mode and then I go and hunt for the next transverse mode, um, probably I'm not very well coupled to it in the first place. And second of all, I'm driving at the resonance frequency of the cavity mode I like. So I'm just not driving some other far detuned cavity mode very much. So with the optics, you really get to pick which mode you're talking about just by tuning your laser to that mode. But with the acoustics, every mode of vibration is in there and you probably don't want to couple to all of them. So this is the mechanism that allows you to send in light to one well-defined optical mode and be sure that it is only transducing the mode of this acoustic mode. All these other acoustic modes are populated by vibrations, thermal, blah, blah, blah. But the light that is in this red mode doesn't care about any phonons except for the phonons in this mode right here. And that holds also for the transverse directions. So you wouldn't care about, yeah. So, so maybe a follow-up question is, so does the acoustic mode that you're coupling to um, hybridize with these other modes, coupled to these other modes? And so this is a, Adam Kaufman was at, wondering this. And I guess related question is, what limits the quality factor of that acoustic mode? What, what determines it and what limits it? Um, when you like hybridize with what? So I guess there's like free space continuum modes maybe, or there's all of the other acoustic modes. Does it, do you couple Adam, to? Yeah. Adam. You have a Fabry Pro cavity in your lab somewhere, I assume, right? Uh, if you turn on the room lights, do the room lights get stuck in your cavity? No. This is like, so the cavity, like, this is why mode matching is hard. Uh, and it's the exact same story for acoustics, right? Uh, a photon that's in one of these cavity modes just stays there forever. It doesn't have any overlap with these free space guys. So there are free space phonons. The what? fact that it's a fluid, though, I mean, it's a linear. Forget the fact that it's a fluid. It's a linear wave equation, just like Maxwell's equations in free space or sound in a isotropic homogeneous medium. Um, so, like in your high finesse cavity, there might be, you know, uh, fluorescent lamp photons shooting through your cavity all the time, but mostly it just doesn't matter. They certainly so, aren't going to get stuck yeah, in there. The photons okay. that are in your cavity don't get knocked out by them. And it's totally the same here. This is just linear plastic wave equation. Yeah, okay. Cool. And this was this is counterintuitive, and it took me a long time to become comfortable with this, but it really is the same story as for optical cavities. So then what what does limit the lifetime of a oh, photon? Yeah. yeah. I'm about to tell you that. That's okay. the very next slide. Cool. Okay, so we have another question from Sujan, maybe that he wanted to know. Uh, can you talk a bit about the heating dynamics from laser absorption in the system? Do you have some insight into the processes causing this? Too much. We have too much insight. Um, so liquid helium is truly transparent. It has a 19 electron volt band gap and no impurity states. It cannot absorb telecom photons. And we have other experiments where we confirm that to a pretty high degree. 
but our cavity is made up of glass and just the regular old dielectric coatings. And they have, you know, kind of part per million absorption. So everything that we see is consistent with the fibers or the mirrors on them absorbing maybe a part per million of the light, getting a tiny bit hot, and then radiating thermal phonons out into the bath of helium, which the dilution refrigerator tries to keep cold, but it's just a simple story of thermal transport. Okay, so I, there's one more question, which maybe also leads into your next slide, um, which is just what is the finesse and quality factor of the of the resonators of I guess both the, so the optical and the optical cavity is sort of 100,000, and you could push it higher, but that, that works pretty well for us. So 100,000 finesse, 100 microns long, line width is about 30 megahertz. Hopefully those numbers are consistent. <laughs> so one thing that I did not talk about much is the acoustic quality factor or the mechanical quality factor. And it's not great. Okay, it's only about a hundred thousand, and that's not the fault of the helium. The helium is really quite lossless at these temperatures. But the only thing that's confining photons to the helium is the fact that they see a big acoustic impedance mismatch when they try to go into the glass. These fancy coatings are not quarter wavelength coatings for the sound waves; they are for the light. And so, basically, every time a photon comes to the end of the cavity, it has a one percent chance of just continuing into the glass. And that's good enough to get us a quality factor of 100,000, but we would like to do better. And so we are doing that in two ways in our lab right now. We now have uh, mirror blanks that have the dual band DBR. They have layers that are appropriate for the optical high finesse. And then they have some extra layers, which are DBRs for the acoustic sound waves. And those same materials, tantalum pentoxide and silicon dioxide, are great for acoustic reflectivity. Um, so our hope uh, is that this will push up the quality factor by about two orders of magnitude. In addition, these cavities will be just two orders of magnitude longer. So these would result in phonon lifetimes on the order of a second in the cavity. And we're getting ready to cool these down in our lab now. We're also interested in solving this problem by working with Jacob Reichel to build ring cavities out of optical fibers because the speed of sound in helium is much less than in any other material. So it is super wants to just totally internally reflect. In fact, the Fabry Pro cavity is like the only geometry that doesn't give you for free total internal reflection of sound waves. So what we're working with Jacob is to build a ring cavity where the coatings are high reflectivity coatings for light to make a nice ring cavity, but where the phonons would be just be tracked by total internal reflection, which would give you a finesse of infinity except it'll be limited by various effects, including surface roughness and uh, wavefront curvature, which we can estimate to give a quality factor of about 10 to the eight. So again, given the slightly larger cavity size, this would result in a phonon lifetime, we think of about a second. And right now we detect sideband photons about once every 10 milliseconds. And in these devices, the state that is heralded dies in 0.1 milliseconds. So there's no way to close the loop and do some interesting quantum feedback. But with second lifetimes, there probably would be. And that's something we're very excited about. The other thing uh, that we're excited about is the idea of taking a whole bunch of these devices, which we routinely cool down, and adding to each one, one piezo. The idea being that if you can take all these devices and just tune them up with a low frequency piezo so that they are all resonant with a single laser, and then you excite the network, and this is obviously very simplified, but you excite this entire array with the laser and wait until you get a click on the SPD. The single photon click here heralds the addition of exactly one phonon to this system, but you don't know which device it came from. So this would herald the production of what's called a W state, which is extremely useful for quantum telecommunications protocols. It does it in a system which is made entirely out of telecom optical fibers and which operates at 1550 nanometers. So all these devices could be in different dilution refrigerators separated by kilometers of fibers. And it does it in devices, which if they're built using this approach would have one second uh, memories. They would basically be able to serve as nodes with second scale uh, quantum memories. And so that's uh, a bunch of the ingredients that are required for distributing entanglement in a way that would allow you to realize the DLCZ type of protocols all in a telecom friendly uh, technology. 
Um, so that's the end of my talk, um, where we are just by way of conclusion is we have these superfluid filled cavities, which have a lot of nice properties for doing optomechanics. Um, we've confirmed that the phonon states that equilibrate in our fridge are indeed thermal. We've confirmed that we can drive them, we can displace them to a very high degree without adding any noise, uh, as far as we can tell. And we're working on new devices um, that would allow us to have much longer phonon lifetimes, to start to access more interesting physics up this quantum hierarchy, possibly with some real um, quantum communications applications. We're interested in what you could do with some exotic quantum hybrids, uh, what you could do by trapping single electron bubbles in these cavities. Um, we're interested in applying these devices for astrophysical dark matter searches. Um, we have some collaborations there. Very last thing I'll just mention is we have a couple other projects in my group. This is the one that I told you about, but we've also interested in build, we've learned how to build, uh, uh, we're interested in optical me mechanical devices that totally get rid of those pesky glass mirrors and consist entirely of superfluid helium. So we have learned how to magnetically levitate millimeter scale drops of superfluid helium in vacuum. We're interested in coupling light into their whispering gallery modes and hopefully realizing some really high finesse optical cavities that way. We've also been studying uh, topological dynamics in non-Hermitian systems. And recently what we have been able to measure is that if you take three normal modes, this is just classical harmonic oscillators, uh, tune them to a non-Hermitian degeneracy and then ask on what uh, sort of space around that triple degeneracy, do you still have double degeneracies? Those double degeneracies constitute a trefoil knot in the space around the triple exceptional point and closed loop operations around that trefoil knot produce braids of the eigenvalues. They braid the normal modes of the, of the system. And this is, has some potentially interesting applications for topological control. Um, so with that, thank you again for your attention. Thank you for joining this virtual uh, seminar and I'd be happy to take more questions. All right. So uh, thanks for a really great talk, Jack. So there's there's a there's a few questions. Um, so let's see. Um, Aruku Senu asks uh, about the ring cavity. Can you explain why three walls are enough to confine the phonon mode? I thought you need to yeah. sort of yeah. So it's, it's maybe a related question. Yeah. It's just that um, the speed like Snell's law for sound, which holds just as well for sound, tells you that any time sound waves are incidents from liquid helium into any solid. I mean, pretty much glass, certainly the case, um, you get total internal reflection unless you're coming in at within three degrees or so of normal. So if you just draw an equilateral triangle, uh, I think you're coming in at 30 degrees from normal on each of those, and that's total internal reflection. Okay. So speed of sound, like speed of light doesn't vary that much from material to material. I mean, like three, that's very exciting index of refraction. But for sound, it can really be orders of magnitude and it just becomes almost impossible. First of all, there's the impedance mismatch, but there's just total internal reflection at sort of all but very nearly normal incidence. So that's why you can do it with just three. Um, so then uh, Aziza was wondering, can you create squeeze states of the helium liquid phonon you know, field? Absolutely, yeah. So we were sort of getting close um, and all the, pro I think sort of all of the protocols for producing squeeze states in CW uh, kinds of approach would work here. So if uh, you were to, uh, instead of having, if you were to drive the cavity uh, simultaneously on the red and blue sideband, um, such that they're both producing sidebands that come out through the photon detector, um, the back action of that measurement would tend to drive you into a squeeze state. And people have done that in the CW approach um, with, um, yeah, with this simultaneous red and blue drive that sort of results in a back action evasion measurement of one quadrature of the motion, uh, whose back action is to uh, produce a squeezed mechanical state. But we are definitely interested, not so, I mean, uh, squeezing is certainly useful for things like uh, these quantum limited parameter estimation. For the, uh, you know, macroscopic quantum phenomena, we'd also be interested in making states that just aren't uh, Gaussian. Uh, you know, really have things like Wigner function negativity and stuff like that. But yeah, this, this is all very much of interest. 
Okay, maybe we'll ask just one more question. So uh, John Simon, I think it's John Simon this time, was uh, was wondering, can you make the cavity shorter to increase the optomechanical coupling strength and enter the single quantum nonlinear regime? No, thank you for your question. <laughs> uh, the problem is as you make it shorter, you know, the coupling rate goes up as kind of the square root of the cavity size as is commonly the case. But kappa, as you make the, at, if you are stuck at fixed mirror reflectivity, so fixed finesse, shorter cavity means kappa goes up linearly. So you actually lose in that regard. And I mean, no, if we could, we would. Um, okay, so um, what's that with that? I think we'll thank Jack one last time for a really great talk. And thank um, you very so, much. yeah, so there'll be the opportunity to chat with Jack in the post seminar discussion room. Um, which the link was just posted in the chat and we'll also post it on YouTube. But so now I'm going to hijack the screen here in order okay. to um, make announcements. So normally we would advertise, uh, let's see here. It's not, for some reason it's not showing me it. Let me try again. There we go. Okay, so normally um, we would advertise our next talk uh, for the upcoming week, but next week is DayMop. So there will be no VAMOS or quantum science seminar. Um, uh, and we hope to, uh, you know, we hope to see you at DayMop. And then um, after that, VAMOS is actually going on summer vacation. So um, we are taking a bit of a break. Uh, we're also, we know that, you know, uh, at least in the US, fortunately, it seems like things are starting to return to something starting to kind of look more like normal and some of the in person seminars and conferences and things may be coming back. So we're, we are planning to continue Vamos, uh, we're hoping to set it up in a way that it will continue long term for many years to come and, and will continue to serve the AMO community, but we also think it's appropriate that uh, it adapt and change a little bit and so we're going to take the next couple months to set that up and make that happen. And you'll be hearing from us both soliciting input on what you want VAMOS to look like when we come back. And also um, you'll be hearing from us when we're coming back, probably in the time scale of sort of end, start, end of summer, start of fall, that kind of thing. Um, and so the last thing I wanna say, since we are taking a break, is I did wanna thank the whole VAMOS board for all their hard work, and especially the junior members of the VAMOS board, Christy John and Aziza for hosting all of the, um, the post-seminar discussions and for doing a lot of behind the scenes work. And I also wanna recognize uh, Lancy Nazaroff, the Q Farm program manager, who's been sort of freelance providing administrative support and helping us edit YouTube videos and stuff like that. And then I also wanna thank the whole audience, everyone who's been tuning in every week. It's been a lot of fun and uh, we'll see you again really soon. So thanks a lot. And now hopefully we'll see you in the post